I'm the Executive Director of the Audio Engineering Society, which, as you all know, is celebrating its 60th anniversary. My introduction to audio maybe is typical of a lot of people, or maybe uh, it's strange. It actually came from my uncle. Um, my family itself wasn't particularly musical at all, and it wasn't, uh, we didn't have uh, hi-fi or anything like that. Uh, but my uncle was a, an electronics genius, no, self-taught. He built his own television set. He, um, he designed uh, loudspeakers and came up with some very interesting uh, loudspeakers. Of course, as you can tell from my accent, I'm from England. So uh, GEC were producing some very interesting metal cone speakers at that time. And uh, he in made one of the first omnidirectional loudspeakers. And uh, I was only uh, probably four or five at this time. And he was a, a absolutely mad keen on opera. And uh, my introduction to music, which was mainly classical because of that, that's what his tastes were, um, were if I was ill, I'd be in bed with chicken pox or measles or something. And he would ring up on the phone and uh, play me the whole of Aida over the phone. Now, interesting moving forward to today, first of all, it's not only mono, it's mono in about 300 to 3 kilohertz, um, but also it showed how cheap it was to use the phone in those days, uh, because I don't think anybody would use a mobile phone now to actually play somebody either. So uh, that really sort of got me interested, got me going, and during my teens I started uh, reading Wireless World, which... Um, I think even over here in the, in the U.S. was a, a popular magazine, but in, uh, in England it was a Bible. And, uh, of course, there were lots of uh, constructional kits for loudspeakers, uh, electronics, amplifiers, and then tuners, FM tuners, and, and that kind of thing. So I spent my early to middle teens uh, constructing. Um, I never played a musical instrument. I always reckoned that my job was to actually put the stylus on the record. Other people could play the instruments. But I did have friends who uh, played guitars, and so I would make you know, amplifiers for them, valve amplifiers as it was. Uh, a company called Mallard, which was later bought by Philips. Um, the equivalent over here, of course, would be RCA. They made not only valves, but they also made they gave a lot of information in constructional articles in books. And so uh, a lot of experience in making um, amplifiers and that kind of thing. And so having gone through school, uh, yeah, what to do? And um, of course, you know, your parents want you to be a banker or something like that. Uh, they wouldn't want you to be the banker nowadays. But in those days, of course, that was a respectable profession. Uh, but that never interested me. And I wasn't actually that interested in going to university because I was very practical. Um, I'd already constructed lots of loudspeaker cabinets, veneered them and everything for friends. And so I decided I should um, try and take up a career in uh, electronics, but audio was the, the passion. And uh, anyway, I ended up in uh, EMI, Electrical and Musical Industries, which uh, in those days... Um, was a very strong uh, musical company. It had previously been um, a domestic products company like Philips, like Matsushita in Japan, that kind of thing. But um, they had a very strong research department. And uh, what that gave you was an opportunity to learn about other things, but also to rub shoulders with absolute geniuses. And I was very, very lucky to do that. And I first went into um, video pickup tube um, research uh, and testing, and I uh, did that for about a year. And then I was, well, half poached because they found out I was interested in audio by the audio research department, um, which uh, was uh, run by um, some very eminent people. And uh, I then spent nine very happy years at EMI Research, working on such things as the very first um, electronic mixer designs that became fashionable. The, anybody who's seen the uh, Beatles book, which shows all the equipment, the TG12345, um, a lot of those circuits I breadboarded on Veriboard, um, and uh, I'm not claiming any 
credit for the quality of the sound because we had some excellent design engineers, but that was where I cut my, uh, my electronics teeth, if you like. And, um, oh, several other projects, but then I went into the, or oh, moved over uh, in the same department to acoustics and loudspeakers. And uh, we were responsible for installing, measuring, um, calibrating, uh, loudspeakers for every single EMI res, uh, recording studio in the world. So this was not only a big responsibility, but also taught you a lot about quality control. Um, after about nine years, I hadn't got fed up with it, but I thought, well, I should look around and try something else, and I actually went to work for a Japanese company, uh, Matsushita, uh, that um, makes Panasonic, and also at that time had a strong Technics hi-fi brand. And although I went initially to be involved in servicing of, um, or service advising on all products, I ended up um, being in charge of the Technics Hi-Fi brand in the UK. Uh, and that was fascinating because a lot of my job was to speak to customers, but on the other hand, to speak to the factory people in Japan who made this. And uh, the Japanese at that time, for the most part, couldn't speak English. There were a few who could. Um, so that was a very interesting time of actually learning about manufacturing in a big way. This wasn't making 100 loudspeakers a day. This was making 5,000 loudspeakers an hour. So it was a, an, an interesting um, change. Well, I'd always wanted to start my own company in 1979. I decided now was the time. If I didn't do it then, I would never do it. And so I left um, Matsushita and started my own company. Uh, called Minim Electronics, and uh, we, uh, the first product was actually um, something, I think you always start off by making something that you want yourself. So if you want it, there must be loads of other people who want it. This doesn't necessarily prove to be true, um, but at that time, you could very easily record uh, television programs on the video recorder, set a timer, and it would record it when you're out. But of course, if you're interested in classical music or a pop concert or something, there was absolutely no way of recording that because you couldn't get a, a recorder for, for radio, which you could program. So we started making timers, and um, the BBC saw these and thought, oh, hang on, here's a company that makes timers. Uh, maybe they can make some things for us. So whilst it was intended this would be a consumer company, it actually turned into both consumer and professional. So we, uh, we made a lot of equipment for the BBC and uh, other stations. But then um, when Ambisonic surround sound um, sort of became at a point where it could be manufactured, we got into that and we made the, um, really the only Ambisonic surround sound decoders that were available on the market. We sold them really throughout the world, not in huge production, but um, that was what we did. And so we, we really made, um, it was a small company, but we made consumer products and we made professional products. And now I'm moving to 1975, uh, I beg your pardon, 1995. And um, the then executive director of the Audio Engineering Society Donald Plunkett um, was due for retirement and they started to search for a new executive director. And I was asked if I would apply. Now, from what I've told you up to now, you would think, well, why? And so I'll just go back a little bit um, to give you a little background to that. So in 1975, when I was at EMI, um, we had the first convention in London and one of the people who was on the committee um, was actually in our lab. And he asked a number of us if we would be, as almost students, prepared to go and help out in the technical tours program. But what's the AES? What, the, what on earth is that? And I had never heard of it. So I started uh, you know, trying to find out. Of course, then, nowadays you just Google on the internet, but it was a bit more difficult then. But um, I found some uh, journals in the library and I thought, well, this looks a bit interesting. So I joined. Uh, just in time for the convention. And uh, within um, a year or so, I had been asked to join the local section committee and 
a few years after that, I became section chairman. And as it progressed, I got more involved. I was involved in the three London conventions. And so I got to know some of the international people. And I was asked if I would stand for the Board of Governors, which I did and failed, which is a lesson to anybody who gets you no know, heartbreak because they don't get in first time. And uh, then I became the uh, Vice President of Europe uh, by election. And then in 1991, I was elected to be President of the Society. So I was on the Board of Governors at that time. So in 1995, when this uh, opportunity came up, that's one of the reasons they asked me. And to be honest, it never crossed my mind that I would, A, get the job because it was an American organization, um, truly international, but it was based in America. To cut a long story short, I did uh, get the job. And since then, since 1995, that's in fact been my full-time job, executive director of the Audio Engineering Society. And it's a privilege to do that, not only because the AES is a, a great organization, but it's the people within the society that make it so rewarding. And I think there are not that many organizations where you can meet people in virtually every country of the world that are members and that you will either know, might have met, have seen a paper published by, or will know somebody who knows them. And so uh, at a personal level, it's been very satisfying. And at a professional level, it's also very satisfying. Uh, 60 years is where the AES has come to. Um, I'm sure it's going to go for another 60 years and beyond. Times are challenging for all of us. It's not always been easy. The AES has gone through a number of times in the past where finances and things have been difficult. It's the same now. But I think... There's so many people who are dedicated in the society. We will have a great future.